Here we go, Ruth. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> no, I may you get tongue. Tell me when you're ready. I may get tongue-tied with it. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth Malhart, it's a pleasure to meet you, and welcome to Heartfelt Video Legacies. And what history you have to share today. <laughs> Do you want to talk about this fabulous house, since we okay. have some photographs of it? Okay, thank you. Yes, this is a house that was built in 1917. It's uh, 7,000 square feet, two-story, wonderful house. I have lived here since 1940, 1952, and I have loved living here, raising my four boys and a girl, so, and a ranch life. I was a city girl, so. So you enjoy being here. Where Where were you born, Ruth? I was born in Ventura, and uh, I didn't have a big family, so I, I didn't know. Well, actually, I was going to get to that. You were the only child in your family. Yes, yes. I and mean, my mother was also the only child. Mm -hmm. And uh, mother's... Mother died when she was 12, and her father died when she was 16. Oh. And she didn't have relatives. Her mother had one sister who didn't have any children, so. And then she died. I don't know which one, the two sisters died when they had six months of each other. So mother managed to finish high school, and then go to a business college in Sacramento and met a girl that they roomed together. They were lifetime friends. Well, then Mother met Dad somewhere, <laughs> and my dad was 18 years older than my mother. But um, I was the only one. That was the Bakers, right? Yeah. So, uh, so how does it feel now that you have... All this family. It, it was one, I can't believe it. Still can't believe I have all this kids, grandkids, and great grandkids, and so. But uh, you feel very blessed about yeah, that. Yeah, my parents lived on the Lemonera Ranch at that time, so my dad was bookkeeper there. They were married in 1919. I was born in 1921, and. He left the Lemonair Ranch when I was three and moved to Satigoy, where he raised Dahlia and Gladiolus bulbs for market. And then the Ventura Theater was built downtown, which was a beautiful, beautiful theater. And the owner wanted a flower shop next to the lobby on Chestnut Street, and in 1927, they opened a flower shop in Ventura. And all the years that they were there, part of the rent was flowers in the lobby, always. Two big, beautiful bouquets. That must have been gorgeous. They were, there was a beautiful lobby, and they added a lot to it. Every so often, they would work all night with funeral sprays for a funeral that was nine o'clock in the morning. And I went to school around the corner from the shop, not where we lived. And so I was at the shop a lot. And uh, they would work all night, many nights, for doing flowers for a funeral. So after the theater closed at 11, I would go over and sleep on a couch in the lobby. <laughs> so, and there has been talk for years about a ghost in the theater. I never saw the ghost or heard it, so I, I don't know. I don't. So you think had no. Was. You had no. You weren't afraid at all to be in there. At no, night. no. I have been in there enough with mother <laughs> doing flowers and. We went to the show a lot. We had a free pass. So 
So a lot of movies in my youth. Let's let's talk a little bit about Satikoy. That's where you were at the time. Well, Satikoy is a little town. We had a sm small house there. I went to first grade in Satikoy, and then when we moved, well, we had the big flood. The big dam broke. The big dam broke, yeah. I really don't remember that much about it. I know that we were all packed up in case we had to move because the Santa Clara River was below us, but they had thought that it possibly it would come on the road above us, so but we didn't we didn't evacuate. But, but you did eventually move. And then we moved into Ventura. So we had the flower shop while we were still in Santa Clay. We'd been in the business for a while when we moved into Ventura. I want to go back a little bit to where you and your dad used to go to the Rose Bowl. Can you talk about that? That was early on before you were That's married. That's back right? in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, dad was in charge of the Ventura float for the three times in the 30s. And uh, so they, now they have places where they build the floats and what have you. They don't in, in the end days. I remember one year it rained so hard, we worked in ankle deep water at a kind of an outside area and things. But those floats that he made, Pinterest points at his city. And the dad, I think, picked poinsettias all over town and things. And he made a lobster once. And then he made a sea servant, which was one of the first floats that wiggled going down the yeah. street. And the, the kids at the junior college who had the taking shop built the, the things. And, I mean, he, his budget was $500 for the floats, and you hear what they cost now. So it was more amateur floats in those days. And then the ball game afterwards. Yeah, and that's what we got was tickets to the ball game, <laughs> the Rose Bowl. Well, I, there was all these questions were asked, you know, from your family, so I was trying to make sure we get it all in. Um, it was fun working. I enjoyed it. I almost ended up on the float of one of them because the gal that had won the contest in Ventura, Elizabeth Smith, and lived up the street from me, didn't show and didn't show and didn't show. And Dad kept saying, you're going to get on that float if she doesn't get here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she finally got there. Then I... She ended up marrying um, the son of C's candy maker, <laughs> but it didn't last. <laughs> oh, it was too sweet. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and, and I with wasn't all this sure. Time, go ahead. I'm sorry. I wasn't sure. I didn't have any dress or anything for it. I kept saying, I can't get up there. Now. <laughs> but she came. <laughs> but she showed up about five minutes before. For right, he was ready to give up. You're, um, you had a great love of books in your life, right? You um, talk I a like bit to about read, that? I like to read, but I like, I like mysteries and I like love stories. And, and Dick never read any novel, he was into history. Oh, he liked history and, 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 and but more of. Uh, you liked fiction, and he. Liked I liked fiction, and he, he didn't read anything, and he, he was a great reader and he remembered everything. So. Well, your 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 family, the boys, they all seem to be very, very. They're very intelligent, and they read a lot, opened yeah. up their minds. Right? Science is one of one of be Dick's favorites. Science. Science. <clears throat> um, when you were a little girl, you liked to roller skate, right? You want to talk a little bit about that? 
I remember uh, one, that was a fun time. I learned to skate on a porch very much like this in Satikoi and the neighbors. And they had girls, and we skated on that porch all the because there was no pavement to skate on and no sidewalks. But we skated on that porch. But after we moved in town, I did roller skate a lot on the sidewalks and things. But then this one night, I, there was a party at the skating rink. There was a skating rink in Ventura at South California, which had originally been a bathhouse on the ocean. And then later on, I've got pictures of my parents at the bathhouse, but uh, they closed in, and then at one time, they covered the pool with a beautiful hardwood skating rink, but it was all cement around the outside. Uh -huh. So this time I was in junior college. I needed to go to the library and do some studying but there was a skating party going on, and I wasn't gonna go to the skating party. We only had one car. So I took the car to, down to go to the library. So I parked in front of the library. There were these two twins, uh, Don and Dean, who were out playing basketball from the Midwest at the junior college. They were headed down the scary thing, and they saw me. And we, they said hi. They said, well, I said, I'm going into the library. We're going to the skating rink. Come on and go with us, blah, 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 blah. I think they wanted a ride the rest of the way. But... <laughs> so I finally did, which is the only time in my life that my parents didn't know where I was going. The only time. Yeah, I always let them know where I was and everything. There was never any debate, oh, you can't go or anything. So so I get down there, and they go off skating, and I see a bunch of my friends. And so I skated some, and then there was, there was a group of five or six of them in a circle standing on the cement chattering between skates. All of a sudden, my feet went out from under me, and I just went down and broke both wrists. <laughs> both wrists at the same time? And then someone called your folks? Yeah. Well, they got me to the... Somebody got me to the doctor, and I called from the doctor's office. But they had to take the bus to the doctor's office. Because you had the car. I had the car. How old were you then? Remember? I think I was probably 17, the junior college. So they had to take the bus to find you. Yeah. <laughs> but that was more fun in school. I got more attention. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody carried my books all of us. <laughs> Oh, that's, so, a, that's an awful way to get attention, though. Yeah, but it was, it wasn't that bad. Um, this one was in a cast, and this one was in a heavy, heavy bandage. So it was not too easy to do too many things. But you couldn't do anything much, yeah. <laughs> so you went to elementary school. I went to first grade in Satikoi. And then I started in Ventura, went to Washington School in the second grade. And then they, when the folks moved downtown to the theater, we were right around the corner from the Plaza School, which is where the post office is now, has been for years. And so I went to school down there and then went to the shop after, afterwards. And then, and then you, you ended up for college going to Berkeley, is that correct? Well, yes, for college. I went all through school in Ventura, through junior college, so I went to Berkeley as a, as a, jun a senior. A junior. Junior. Well, there were a lot of things that happened in Berkeley, right? 
somebody brought so you'd make cookies? Well, I had met my husband the year before at Ventura College, just the last semester, and he went up to Ber uh, Davis, so he would come down and always brought the makers for uh, chocolate chip cookies, which you had to ch chop all the chocolate in those days and days. So, so uh, I was studying statistics more than anything else. I was heading towards a math degree, but I decided I didn't want to teach or work with it. So, so you didn't know what to do with it. So no. I didn't go back. For my senior year, I went to Woodbury College in Los Angeles to do more bookkeeping. So, so you, when you finished Woodbury, you you worked in, yes, in bookkeeping. I got a job in San Fernando in the American Can Company, and in the division they were just beginning milk cartons. Isn't That's that when milk cartons were brought in, that was the beginning. And then I had applied it back in Ventura, and I, after about 16 weeks at San Fernando, I got an offer for the job in the city clerk's office in Ventura, and I decided to come home. That so, was good. So, you want to talk a little bit about the Depression? What went on? The Depression was rough. I don't ever remember being hungry or not having something to wear. But mother and dad struggled very hard in the flower shop. That's not a good business in the Depression. That's definitely a that luxury. That was a luxury, yeah. But they handled it. But they finally, in the early 30s, they lost the home they bought in Ventura. Did they, they lost it? They didn't sell it. They lost it. They lost it. And we moved to a house that wasn't too great. And then mother, my mother just got quite ill over the Depression, had pretty much of a breakdown. Dad had, mother had relatives in uh, Yosemite. And he had lost his job in Bakersfield and was doing manual work in Yosemite, but they had a house outside. So Dad and I took Mother up there for a few months to recover. Didn't and she have some allergies? She developed a hay fever type thing, which we think came from something in the house that they rented. Hmm. And anyway, we moved, and I was home alone when the, uh, two men came to the house, and they were from the government because there were houses, there was houses after World War I that were open to the veterans. And this house we were in was supposed to belong to a veteran but they were supposed to live in the house unless they moved away. Well, he was still living in Ventura, but renting the house. I think his payments were like $33, and he was renting the house for 50, and he wasn't paying for it. So they said he was about to lose the house and my dad asked if we'd have a chance to buy the, which we did, and we bought that house. Good. And that's where they lived until my dad passed away. Yeah. My mother and dad were, I just, I can't remember ever seeing them fight. I can remember mother getting a little after dad a little bit. Dad had one little room. It was a little office in the house which you could close the door on and nobody even knew the room was there. Huh. He was a stamp collector. 
And he loved that stamp collection. And uh, that room would get a little messy sometimes. My mother was as neat as anybody could possibly be. Everything went back where it belonged, oh, except for my dresser drawer. But, <laughs> and she'd spring clean every spring. Nothing looked ever any different than when she got fit, <laughs> than when she started. So, so did she get into the stamp collection room? Huh? Did she get into the stamp collection no, room? No. He wouldn't allow her. No. no. But, uh, <clears throat> Dad has had some unusual things. After they quit the gift shop, he wanted to open a little stamp shop, and he's he was eighty three when he died, so it was eighty when he opened that, and. So Somebody got to him, I'm sure, because there were things in there that I had seen as a kid and, and no record. I got in there, and the mail had been scattered every place. He hadn't opened things. He hadn't paid taxes and things. Oh. So I think he had a stroke at some time or other, and we did not realize it. He died in his sleep. Mother found him dead. Oh. But uh, That's and what I a lot went of people... in to try it. Straighten up that business, and it was. And he'd been in the florist business, he'd taken care of everything. So I think he, something happened that we didn't know. Right. Because I don't think he would have ever left it now, the way it was. Was he the one who was a friend with Dr. Tilly? No. How, how does Dr. Tilly fit in? Dr. Tilly's wife and Dick's oldest sister were very good friends. And Dr. Tilly wasn't from Oxnard, but Dr. Tilly's wife was another old family in Oxnard. I see. And Marie and, and she were good friends. So So Dr. Tilly took care of all the kids or anything that happened? Yeah. Was he, did he, did he, he was come? not an MD. He was not an MD? Yeah. What was he? It's a D.O. They're wonderful. I oh, like osteopaths. I just loved him. He was so good. And just, and our nurses down at the little hospital where he practiced would tell you, Dr. Tilly never raised his voice. He never got mad at any of the nurses or things. He was just... That. A lot of patience and love. But also, was, how wonderful, how fortunate for you to have that Dr. Tilly with all your children, and you always would feel... And he would come out at the house. Right. And, uh, Fantastic. And I was pregnant with one of them, and it was getting close. And he called me, and he said, I'm going to be out of town for two days. So it was just... You were in touch been, with him all the time. Couldn't have been a nicer man. Fabulous. I'm happy for you. How old were you when you met your husband? You met Dick? Uh, 18. Yeah. That, that was in Ventura, right? It was in Ventura. Mm -hmm. It was my last year of junior college. And he lived in Oxnard on a ranch, this ranch. And he had graduated from high school a year behind me. He graduated in 39. And then he ran the thrashing machine for bean, lima bean thrashing in the fall. It didn't come over to Vendor College until the spring break. And they, we met on a, on, a on a school bus going down to the ice skating thing in Los Angeles which somehow I was vice president of the class and I organized the whole thing. Uh -huh. And on the bus, I didn't have a date, I went with a girlfriend. And uh, So what was Dick's, your first date with him? What, Dick what? sat behind us and offered to give us a ride. I was supposed to call my dad when we got back, but he took Shirley and I took Shirley home and they dropped me off. And then a couple of days later, he asked me for a date, so. Where'd you go? I think to the show, 
We went to the show a lot. Uh -huh. I can't really remember where we went on the first day. But you thought he was pretty special, though, right no, away. No, no, like Jane, he was fun, always fun, tall. Tall, yeah. handsome, and fun. <laughs> so, so yeah. how long was it after you started dating that you actually he asked you to marry him? We got married in December of of nineteen forty-five. <laughs> You're giggling. <laughs> Yes, we'd gone together almost six years off and on. And this is... Six years? Uh, almost six years, yeah, we met and, and uh, had fun together. I had been engaged to somebody else for a while. And... Um, Anyway, we'd been out to the show right around Thanksgiving time. I can't remember whether it was before or after Thanksgiving. I think it was right after Thanksgiving. And we sat in the back in the parking lot and talked a little bit. And he said to me, when are we getting married? And I said, oh, well, you'll know. And... Uh, then he said, I want to be married before Christmas. He said, I want to spend Christmas with you. Okay, he was Catholic, I wasn't. And so we went to the priest and there was an Advent day which started the first Sunday of December. And at that time you couldn't get married next day. So oh. So he said, you can't get married before December unless you get married on the 1st. And this is right around Thanksgiving time. So, and I had to take lessons. My folks weren't real happy about that rushed marriage. They weren't happy about... The rushed marriage. The rushed marriage, yeah. And I'm sure a lot of people figured it was a shotgun wedding, which it wasn't. They all thought you were... Pregnant, and so you had to hurry up. So we got married in a hurry. Yeah. And uh, so you had Christmas together. We had Christmas together. <laughs> and ever since then, the Christmas has been a big thing in your family, hasn't it? Yes. We first lived in Santa Rosa Valley, or they had a property up there that. He wanted to develop it. It had been bought as a, a pasture for the, all the horses they had farmed with or much earlier. And so we built a little house up there and lived up there until 1952, which is when I had my fourth child. I had three boys and a girl. When we moved up there, it was, our place was the longest telephone from Oxnard, and it was a 10-party line. A 10-party line? And there were no vacancies. They did hook us up so we could call out, but we had to go to the neighbors to, to, <laughs> to uh, get a phone call. So. Party lines are hard. I don't know. Huh? Party lines are difficult. When I was a little girl, we had a party line. I remember that. It seemed like every time you wanted to call, there was somebody on it. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you pick up that call, and there was somebody on it all the yeah. time. Hello, hello. Yeah. Well, oh. I made friends. Well, the neighbors across the road were old friends of the Mulhearts anyway. So she was very nice. And if I had to make a call, she would let me use the phone. <laughs> But, uh, Why don't you tell them, say who your children are and who's the oldest? And well, we have Richard Jr. And then uh, my number two son is Lynn Edward. And number three is Dina, Dean Lewis. I wanted to name him Dean Allen, but then that would made him his initials Tam, and I didn't think that was the <laughs> thing Damn. to do to third boy. <laughs> yeah, that would be too much. 
So, and then Donna, Donna Ruth, which I don't like the name, but Dick insisted that her middle name Donna be Ruth. Ruth be your name. So. And then the, the youngest? And then we moved in when Donna was a month old. Oh, okay. So when you were here is when your youngest was born. Yes. And Donna. Uh, Alan. Yeah. We moved into an empty 14-room house and put up a Christmas tree and beds. <laughs> <laughs> right away. You moved it just Christmas before Christmas. Eve. <laughs> oh, good. So tell me a little bit about the adventures you had traveling and where that, how that came up. You both seemed to like that. Well, we had traveled with the kids in the United States, some have gone across the country and what have you. But then in 1962, Dick was invited by the governor of California to join a group of varied farmers, all different kinds of crops, to go to Russia, which was very early going into Russia. And it was one of President Eisenhower's idea is this people to people. So there had been one group in Russia before they were. And uh, did I you was, go with him or did no, he? No, I wasn't invited to go along. It was just the growers. I think there were a couple of women along. I know one was a chicken raiser and something else. <clears throat> But then it was decided before he left that I would meet him in Paris because they were coming back to Paris. So I left. I had a wonderful person taking care of the kids. And I flew to um, Copenhagen and spent three or four days in Copenhagen and then I went to Brussels and spent three or four days, and then I met him in Paris. You flew alone and, okay. And I went uh, over the pole, and we stopped in Greenland for fuel, and then we had 30 or, or more Danish soldiers enter the plane going back to Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no sleeping once they got up. <clears throat> and I really hadn't fly, flown then much. And we landed in, in uh, Iceland. No, we landed in Greenland. Greenland. Which is more ice than Iceland. On a... On a frozen flight strip and then we when we descended the pin we went into a tunnel and we walked under the tunnel into the airport and then we were met with hot chocolate and just oh, wonderful but that was my first flight so it was interesting how long was the flight in those days like to go to copenhagen do you remember it must have been nine hours or so. So we went over the pool, which was the shorter route. Mm -hmm. I met Dick in Paris, and we spent a, f a couple of days. And then part of the group was going to Israel. Oh, the um, man from the state had planned that, and I could go on that part. So we spent, I think, 10 days in Israel, which was very interesting. And then Belgian Airlines, which was called Sabina, had a package that if, from where you would watch your flight for, from them, you could stop all the way back to that and they had a deal where they'd arrange the stop, meet you at the airport, get you to your rooms and things. 
So we had signed up for that. So as we came back, we stopped in Italy, France, all the way to England. And uh, that was wonderful. But it gave us enough knowledge of, of Europe that uh, in 67, when we bought a VW Bluss and picked it up in Amsterdam and took all five kids to Europe with no reservations, no nothing, we stayed in pensions. And I'm quite sure we stayed in a couple of red light districts, <laughs> but uh, stayed in warehouses. That's a great way to go, though. It's total freedom. Oh, yes. And there would give us some breakfast was included. And I had packed each one of them had a small amount of clothes and they had to wash them every night. <laughs> and uh, I think it was it was a good way of place to tell my boys about bathrooms down the hall and you know, it just wasn't What an adventure. Yes, it was great. Is that when you were in Paris that time? Is that when you got those crystals you No, wearing? I got the crystals when we met, well, like, in Paris. Yeah, like, it was at that time before we went to Israel. We had the guide from Russia still with us, or just Dick and me, and he was showing me us around. And I said, do you know where I could buy some crystals? I really wanted to sit here. And he said, okay. And we walked down a dark alley and up a couple of flights of stairs. And then there was a jewelry stop at the top of those stairs. And I bought these and I've loved them. I've worn them so much. But I've often wondered if they were stolen or <laughs> something. <laughs> it was really down a dark alley and up some stairs. <laughs> I paid twenty dollars for them. <laughs> twenty, they're beautiful, <laughs> uh, and I wear them so much. So after that trip, when did you start going on those uh, those barges? Well, that was in '62. Uh -huh. um, I think we did some more traveling in the U.S. and in '67. We decided we'd take the kids to Europe, and so we ordered a VW bus, and uh, there was a notice in the mail. There was a meeting at Wagon Wheel Restaurant, which is now gone, of a travel agency about tours of Europe, and that was in. That was a charter flight we took over was supposed to be for students and parents. So we flew to Amsterdam and then drove all over. We covered about 5,000 miles in Europe with the kids. And uh, That was also unplanned, just free. Unplanned is where we were going every day. And it was a great trip and fortunately if I'd lose my cool, Dick would keep his or vice versa, so. <laughs> Did you lose your cool a lot? Uh, once in a while, yes. What, what would trigger that? Just trying to find a place to stay, mostly. <laughs> I'm sure we stayed in some red light districts, but, but, uh. But, but the red uh, was good. Yeah, <laughs> and, um. Before we left, I had a call from a good friend who had been in Europe during the war, and he had stayed for a month in a family's home in the little towny country, Luxembourg. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, so we did. We called them, and they were wonderful to us. And, told us about a special little old hotel in France, in Paris. So after that charter flight, flight, one of the first stops 
was in Duderstadt, Germany, which is where Dick's family came from, and there were still relatives. What's the name of that town? Duderstadt. Duderstadt. I don't know how you spell it. No. So we spent two or three days there, and they, their town had been divided by the wall. There, people, there were some farmers that had property in Duderstadt over the line and couldn't get to them and things. So it, um, it was very interesting to meet and Dick's aunt, his mother's older sister, was stuck in Germany during World War One and things. So it, uh, her father had taken her back to marry somebody there, and she got stuck there. The other two were here. But um, there was an interesting, and it's an there's another city in Germany, I can't think of it, that's known for its old buildings. And Duderstadt is very similar, but not as big. Is so, that in the northern or the southern part of Germany? It's right on the border of Berlin, of Russia. Oh. It's where the wall was, mm -hmm. but it's northern Germany. Mm -hmm. So um, So then after that trip you came back home. Yeah. And you and Dick had urge you still had great urges to travel everywhere, didn't you? Yeah. So you started going on those what do well, you call those? And a couple of freighters. 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 And uh, actually the first freighter we went on was in the fifties. Dick came in one day and said, everything is under control, everything's planted, everything, we can go someplace. I'd like to try a theater. So we got on the line, and four days later, we boarded a freighter in uh, Long Beach that was going through the Panama Canal, which never made any stops. We went from Long Beach to Brooklyn on a freighter cadell, and there were two single men, another couple, and Dick and me. So that, that got us going. Going. So, so where did you go on that first trip? The first trip went from Long Beach to Brooklyn. To Brooklyn. And of course, Dick had two sisters living in the East. Okay. So one in Boston and one in New York. Well, you... You, you'd you went to a lot of places, but particularly we wanted to talk about Pakistan. Pakistan. Pakistan, we were invited to go to Pakistan. We were invited by the American Farm Bureau. The other couple was from the um, Farmers Union. They were from Texas, and the other one from Upper New York wine growers up in New York from the Grange. So there were three couples of us, and it was a people to people. It was one of the things that Eisenhower started on the people to people things. Mm -hmm. So we spent six weeks in Pakistan. Well, and it's, how, did you, how did you like the way Everything was happening in Pakistan. You had some problems. It was different. We were three women, and we were three women at most every place, and no other women. We had banquets and things. You saw the country from one end to the other. And, and the, the, the women were, were in the background. The women were in the background. They turned their backs. Girl children would turn their backs. The boys were up to us, trying to talk to us and things. We three women got to meet some of the women in the house you know, or uh -huh. something, but it was quite an experience. It was quite an experience. It's a poor country. We were in the tribal country, and they 
came and talked to us at the border, and then one of the border guards invited us women over, but not the men. And our leader would not let us go, <laughs> so I didn't get into oh. Afghanistan. But uh, but the tribal area is really something. We went into one, they showed us around, and we went into one tent where they were making M guns, oh. guns, and... Uh, they were just done on a little wood fire and what have you. But, and then Dick got in trouble there. there Dick got the, in trouble? The mountains, the distance area looked a lot like Death Valley. And so Dick climbed up, because there's walls, it was a walled city, Dick climbed up on the on the truck to take a picture, and oh boy, all hell broke loose. But he was in big trouble. They were figured I, he was taking pictures of the women, was what they said. Oh. You know, and you never saw the women. And it was a very innocent picture he was going to take. But so that he, was one He of, didn't get the picture. No, he didn't get That was one of your better trips, but then you, you said. I know you went to a lot of places, but did you want to talk about Somalia a little bit? Somalia is probably the poorest country I have ever seen. We were there before the pirates and things, but it's, and we were there 18 days because it took that long to unload, we unload the freighter. We were carrying... 50 gallon drums of edible oil and then 100 pound sacks of rice. And we were there during Ramadan season. I don't know what you know about Ramadan, but there is no drinking, eating from sun up to sundown for that month. So here, the, and it's hot. And here, these poor guys were unloading that ship with this hot weather and no food and oh. no water. Oh. And so it, it took that long to unload it. One of the fun things to watch, though, was another ship came in. It's a very small port. It held five ships. Another ship came in, and they were loading goats, cows, and camels on this ship to take someplace and watching those camels in those big sacks or things, floating those camels into those ships kept us interested all day. <laughs> well, the camels weren't very happy? Well, they, they seemed to be all right. Somalia, the city of, in Somalia, I can't think of the name now. Mogadishu, which is the main city, has the most beautiful beach, probably the prettiest beach I've ever seen. But they built a slaughterhouse just in the edge of it on the hill. So all the, all blood, the blood and what everything went into the ocean. Oh. So of course there were sharks and you couldn't couldn't in this hot country and this gorgeous beach and they couldn't use that beach. Just really strange was, decision, huh? Oh. Now I, I know you've been on a lot of trips and a lot of your family wanted to know about other trips, but is there was there something else that you think is important to share about another trip you took or Well we went to India. In southern India. Southern India? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that that beautiful memorial to his wife. Oh, the Taj, Taj Mahal. Mahal. It's the most beautiful bit of building I have ever seen. That is just gorgeous. And we were there during the afternoon and evenings, and the sunset was so beautiful. I'm sure in person it's 
much it, different than the, the yeah. picture. Yeah. Well, the picture is great, but so it was. It's just absolutely. I think it has to be the most beautiful building in the How world. How long did it take him to build that for his wife? Several years. Yeah. When you were on the trips, your children were here. Yes. Did they get in any trouble while you were gone? Was they well behaved? Or what <laughs> happened? <laughs> no, not really. Well, the, Lynn, I think, caused a little trouble with the lady that was here, but and Lynn? he was mad at us for going. So it's the year he started high school, and it just was a little bit bad. But so uh, was it? How did he act out? He gave her some trouble. The lady who was watching them. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I had always wanted to go to China from the time that I read the Pearl Bucks Good Earth book, which was when I was a teenager. And there was a Farm Bureau. The American Farm Bureau in California had a wonderful travel guy in the thing, and we traveled with him. So, so there was a, 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 a trip to China. It was the first China. No, they'd, been, they'd had one trip the year before, and we missed that. So, so you took that one. So we took the second one. Where did you go? And well, we flew to Vancouver, Vancouver, because we, America, U.S. wasn't flying to China then, but there were Canada was. So we went. To, first thing we did was went to meeting of all of us that were going. <laughs> and there were two groups. And the leader of the other group, is this, this was the first time our group leader was going to China, but the other, the other leader was explaining what he was going to do. And he said, for instance, Mr. Mulhart will do something. I don't remember what it was, but I was so surprised he knew his name. Well, he came up to me afterwards and he said, I went to school with Jean at Oxnard. <laughs> Oh, the other leader? Oh, my <laughs> the other leader. And he was wonderful to us over there. He's now one of the big shots at the harbor here, but uh, he was doing travel. And then he spoke Chinese like a native. So. So, so what year was that when you went to China? Do you remember? 1980. I think it was 1980. There weren't very many no, people it was going one to of the China. Very, one of the first trips to China. And uh, What was your impression? Then we went in 1880, I think, and then we went back again in 2001. And the change in China in that time was yep. unbelievable. There were no cars. They were using the buggies and things, hauling everything down the street. Back in the hotel room we had, well, they, they uh, put us, said we couldn't go to the hotel we were supposed to the first night. They had to put us in, and they put us into a, a pretty antique china. Which, uh, the, the bathrooms were still holes in the floor. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and things, and then um, we went back 20 years later, and the hotels are gorgeous, the place, there's cars everywhere. It was on freeways over the city, and it, have you been to China? Mm -hmm. and, uh, I went in 82. So you went a couple of years after we did. And you're right. They yeah. were just starting to get some Russian cars in. Russian yeah. cars. There were no cars on the street. Mm -hmm. and, then it, and then that length of time later, and it's a modern city. Unbelievable. Uh -huh. Not out in the country, but uh, and that time we went to see the 
So you went to Beijing? And, Did you go to Shanghai? Yes. And we went to see the uh, soldiers and the horses and things that they found there. Oh, yes. The, yeah. I've got a group of them on the mantle in there. It's incredible. It was amazing. And then we were there. They were starting to build the the dam, you know, which took out all those houses on the hills and things because we took a, a boat on the Yangtze. Oh, uh, so uh, yeah, the Yangtze River? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I couldn't believe the change in Beijing. That was really a change, I'm sure. It oh. kind of looks, when I see pictures of today, I think it looks like Disney World or something. <laughs> it's so different oh. from what it was. We've been the first time. Did you go to the Ming tombs? Yes. Scary. Yeah. Well, so... Um, and the Great Wall. Oh, the Great Wall, yes. Uh, a lot of people who built that Great Wall were buried in it. I'm sure. That's what they said, yeah. Yeah. So your impression was amazing to come back the second time. It was amazing. It was 20 years wow. between the two trips, and I could not believe the change. The, so, um, what you, they'd made in, the, in that 20 years. Did you like the food? Get along fine with it. We had a funny experience. The, they put us in this hotel that wasn't being where we regularly stay. So we went down for breakfast, <laughs> and they said we could have an American breakfast or a Chinese breakfast. <laughs> and so I think, I don't remember which one we ordered, but there was another table of Americans across the room and the thing. And um, Dick wandered over there because they were having American breakfast. We had Chinese. And he stood over at the table and said hello to him or something. This guy looks up at Dick and he said, you're a Mahard. Dick says, you're a Jans. And the Jans family, the ones that built the Mall in Thousand Oaks, and Jan's family was a lot of land, and they right. owned a lot of stuff. And and uh, thing, and one of the Jan's brothers was more friendly, played golf with Dick's brother. But I mean, here Small you are, world. all the way across the world, and the guy says, "You're a mallard." <laughs> we had met one man in the group with us who was a popcorn farmer in the Midwest. And he came with a case of of canned salmon. And I think at every meal he had, he sat there and ate a canned salmon. He didn't want to have the food. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, and you want to talk about any other travels or is, are those the most important well, ones? Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed Australia and New Zealand, and uh, you've seen you've really seen the world. I've seen all the continents. Yeah. And, what uh, did you think of Australia and New Zealand? Well, the first trip was was great. Uh, we saw the capital of the other countries. Then we went back once and took a bus ride across to Alice Springs, and then back, and we flew to Alice Springs and took the bus back. And and that was so different, but uh, it's all desert. It's a long ride in desert, but there are things they saw. Cooper Petty, where all the opals come from, which is practically all underground. We stayed in an underground hotel. Wow. And so, I would, and I've been back to New Zealand. Well, I've been two trips to Australia. I would love to go back to New Zealand, but I've never. That's supposed to be gorgeous. I it, haven't been there either. It's a beautiful. It's beautiful. So. Did you go back into any Aboriginal country? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. 
So, so out of all these travels, which was everywhere, did you have a favorite? Well, I think Hawaii was one of them. <laughs> we had a great deal in Hawaii. We had friends that lived here and had a ranch here. But they went over, they had a, a, a condo in Hawaii, right on Waikiki Beach. And every time they'd want to come back here or travel or something, they'd call and say, you want the apartment? And right. so we spent uh, some time every year in Hawaii, which... It's pretty fabulous. Yes. We thoroughly enjoyed, made friends with their friends, and just, and Dick liked being right in Waikiki. He lived in the country. You know, so many people want to go to the country, so he liked the city. He liked living the city. Down, mm -hmm. And we could walk it. And we had the use of their car. I mean, it was a great deal. So you can say Hawaii was one of your favorite places. Yes, yes. And, it, and it's an entirely different vacation. I mean, it's more of a, a vacation than seeing everything. What I wanted you to start talking about are some fascinating things or outrageous things that your children did over the years, like Donna, <laughs> like lipstick, Talk, talk about when she did that. Uh, Dick found her in my our bathroom in our bedroom upstairs. And she had been into my lipstick and she had it all over her face. And she was covering her face with, with band-aids Band -Aids. to cover it. To fight it. <laughs> she got a little spanking and oh. then Dick brought her down on the front porch and took a picture of her crying. And I said, that's the, why take a picture of her when you? <laughs> well, he thought that was outrageous. Well, how about some of your other children over the years? Well, Lynn was often get, getting thing to things. Now, Lynn is the airline pilot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of Dean's friends I used to come out to play. Well, it was Lynn's friend. And I worried about him. I could see him jumping out of the barn or something. I worried more about other kids that were out here than I did mine, because they never did that. But, and they drove tractors from the time they were four years old. I looked out my kitchen window one time, and I saw my car, my car going by. Your car going by? My car going by. <laughs> And I ran out to the front door, and my oldest son turned the corner, and he was sitting on two heads of cabbage to see out the window. Two heads of the cabbage? Oh my but God. his dad had sent him home because he had one more car than he needed out at the ranch. <laughs> I never, that car went by, and as far as I was concerned, there was nobody driving it. <laughs> Two heads of cabbage, yeah. so he could see. So he could see, and uh, they all drove. They all drove tractors. They all were with him, and they learned to drive tractors very early. Donna learned to drive a tractor. Donna, Donna was a good driver, very good. They were all good drivers. So. We were out in Death Valley once, and um, I don't know if you've ever been to Death Valley, but this is when Donna was like 10 years old, and there was were two lane dirt roads and what have you. But Dick put Donna behind the wheel, she drove all over Death Valley. We she was really good. We never saw a cop. But um, she was she was a really good driver. Oh, that's on Anacapa Island. Anacapa, yeah. Yeah, we started. Dick, they had a boat club here, which my husband belonged to, small boat club, and they decided to do a trip to Santa Clara, and they rented a 
a larger boat for us women, and the men were going and their little ones. Dick went with a friend in a 14-foot outboard and uh, started out this morning. And normally you could be in San Santa Cruz within an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. But the w weather came up, the, s the waves came up, and it was just rugged. And we're out in the ocean, and one of the, I think it was a 16 or 18 foot boat that one of the men had built himself. And all of a sudden it stood up and down and sank. I can still see him out in the ocean with his arm up, save my camera. Says we picked him up. So we got to Anna Kappa and they said, no more, we can't go any further. <laughs> and my husband was riding a little 14 outboard. Somehow Bob said to him, throw the anchor up. Dick forgot to let go. Oh. <laughs> and then one other ship, one other bigger boat, started sinking out there. And uh, the guy that owned it was quite well to do. And he was from oh, the oil place in Texas friend of one of them, the one that Dick wrote with. And he just said, let it go. But some of the men went out and rescued it. But, and there's no water on Anacapa. And they had taken a five gallon bottle on the big boat, but that's all the water we had. But wasn't there something <laughs> no. about a lighthouse there? Also? Yeah, there was a lighthouse on Did Anacapa. Did you stay there? Still there. And uh, Frenchy was the, he ran the lighthouse, and he was the only one that lived on that account. Oh my. Nobody else ever lived there, nobody else. So he came up with some extra water. He came up with enough lobsters for all of us. Oh, okay. But we slept on the rocky beach at night, and then we were coming home. I think it was a Friday, we were coming home Sunday. So we all came home Sunday, never got to, Santa Never Cruz. got to Santa Cruz Island. The, the well, weather, a... that channel can be very rough. Yes. And it has had a lot of boat problems. So you've got people from inland and they think they know the ocean and they don't. And they're, I don't seem to see it as much anymore. They have better equipment, I guess. But I can remember the years when there were constant accidents out there on the ocean. Yeah, it got really rough. Mm -hmm. So it was, was Richard was just a baby yeah. when we did that. Uh, he's okay. 70 now, so <laughs> Richard's the oldest. And uh, he got into electrical engineering and he went, the, all three of the boys, four of the boys went to Loyola University in Los Angeles. Loyola University. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he got into the radio down there, ran the radio station in Loyola. And things and graduated with his degree, but also he went into computers and he's had his own computer um, business, which is out in the house in the back, computers all over the place. And he's done a lot of programs for, started out with agriculture, which nobody was doing programs for agriculture uh -huh. Uh -huh. when he started out, he's done that. He does payrolls for a number of ranches and he's just been on his own and likes it. And, uh, Tell us about the Ventura Beach House and how okay. that happened. I'm going to start on the beach a little bit. The Farias first allowed people to camp up there back in the tens or even before the 19th century, 17th. Anyway, um, 
I know that we camped up there a couple of times or rented one of the little shacks because there were little, there was no water and there was no plumbing. So if, if you stayed up there, you had to take your own water and most of them had out of it. And then, um, anyway, I remember it as a child. And then Dick and I, after we were married, sometime, we looked at a couple of places out there, but then decided we wanted to travel with the children, and we were afraid if we bought it, we'd have to use it all the time, and it would stop some of our trips. So we kind of quit thinking about it. And then I got a call from one of my other friends from school, and she said, did you know Helen has sold the beach house? And uh, it was built by her stepfather. Anyway, I said, oh, gee, we might have been interested. So evidently, my friend Barbara called uh, Helen's mother, Nell, and said, we'd be interested if something happened. I got a, a call from the owner's wife that Virginia Frias had not accepted the other ones. And you had to visit up there, and you had to be somebody she accepted. And um, we were buying it with me as a trustee, but we bought it in the, for the children, the five of them, and I was handling it. And I gather the other people were doing the same thing, but they were going to let the children handle it from the beginning. And Virginia didn't like that. So they, we went up to see it, and it was one of the most beautiful days at the beach that's ever been there oh. that day. And uh, we said we'd take it. They had a price that the bank had set. We said we'd take it. Dick and I went on to Santa Barbara, the other the kids went home, and it wasn't until we signed the escrow that they told us that somebody had come by and wanted to buy it and offered them $20,000 more than what they were charging us. And they said, no, we said we'd be all right, they were going to hold it. No, we had signed nothing. So they could have gone out from under us. But went through a month's end goal, we took over, and we've had it and enjoyed it ever since. And it's in the name of your children, right? It's in the it's always belonged to the children. I had lost my father that year, and so actually we bought the house with what mother had left me, which wasn't a lot, but it worked out. The house wasn't expensive either. Mm -hmm. It's a small house, but it's perfect for us. Perfect, yeah. It's just perfect. You have many, many <coughs> enjoyable times, I'm sure. I wouldn't want to live there all the time, but... No. <laughs> but it's, it's perfect. We've done a little change. Well, it didn't have the back room, the garage. Oh. And it had to have a garage to satisfy the county. So... And the garage has had a car in it twice. <laughs> so it's been a perfect, we bought it in 1975. And uh, well, it's been great for all of us. The other thing, Lynn was in Vietnam at that point. So we sent him a package and said we were looking at it. But uh, he sent back, I can't imagine buying anything better than when my brothers and sisters. So. Great. So uh, he we were was, all happy. He was flying a fighter pilot in Vietnam at the time. Oh. He was stationed in uh, Thailand, and he was flying it up for, so uh, he made a lot of things. He has three distinguished flying crosses. Did he fly helicopters too? No, he never flew helicopters. Oh. And then later on, he went with the airlines. 
silly this flu right. for Condell Lyme for years. But you were really happy when he came home, I bet. Huh? You were happy when he came home. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I certainly didn't know, and he didn't let us know of any of the problems he had until after he was home. Has he told you about <coughs> some things that happened over there? Has he ever told you? Yes, some. Pretty. A little more about a year ago than I've ever heard. But he was in Vietnam when we bought the house. But we sent him a, a video and the whole plans. And he just came back. I don't know anybody. I'd rather go in debt with than my brother, so sister. So it's been a and it's he been a very nice thing. I'm he glad. got too old to fly in the airline, so he's now working on charter flights, right? For years, airline pilots in the United States had to retire at 60. Every other country retired at 65. So they um, it took an act of Congress to change the time, and they worked on it for quite some time. It finally went through the month before he turned 60. Uh -huh. So he got to fly till 65. And now he's doing charter flights. How old is he now? He's 69. Very good pilot. Yeah, so there's no problem with him doing the charter flights. That's yeah. great. Is for a private company? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's out of San of Camarillo. And the plane he was flying had to be refueled every, once every hour. So he refueled. Uh, one time he refueled seven hours in a flight, so seven times. You know, I, this is not my table originally. We had, actually, what we had was a ping pong table years ago. When he came home from college, his brother wanted a piece of land surveyed. And Eddie said, what do you want? And Dick said, I want a ping pong board. And so it cost Eddie $11 to get this thing. And we heard the rest of Eddie's life. Everyone said, I paid you too much for that landscaping. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dick bought another one. And we had a base made and had those two boards on it. And I covered it with tablecloths. And there were a lot of ping pong on in this room, too, went on in this room. They weren't supposed to get the chandelier. And then we had the two boards, so there were many times that we put up a base for the other one, and we had the two tables going clear in there. So it could fit everybody yeah, in there. Yes, we said. I think the most we had at the table was 28. 28. Wow. But, uh, so, so that, uh, so now you, with the, Hevel, the family has a lot of memories of eating at this table. Of course. That's a gr that's great I'm not to ready have. to have that many anymore. No, no, no. That's a lot. <laughs> Dean farmed for quite a long time. Farmed. And then he uh, went into a business with two partners, which has been a great business of packaging, the package boxes, and all the things packaging. that he used in farm products. Mm -hmm. He has a, owns a building down here that they built. He retired from that a year ago because he and his wife wanted to travel. And then we lost her last December. Dean's wife passed his away. His wife passed away. Very suddenly. Yes. That's very, right. very suddenly. Well, and he's doing fine. Tony, his wife, loved to buy houses and then redo them and uh -huh. sell them. And she did beautifully. So they had bought this. This was the biggest house they had ever bought, this last one. And it's pretty well finished. It's got some more work to do, which Dean is finishing off. Beautiful house. But it has more square pace than this house. Wow. And he's there by himself now. <laughs> Is he going to sell it? I don't know. He's finishing up 
plans to only want it, and we'll see. Okay. Right now, he seems to be content to staying there. Good. He has his one daughter and son in Camarillo, and they're there with him a lot. And he's That's so, good. He's so good with children. He just loves them. So. We forget that. Forget that. <laughs> you you gonna... know nothing about that. <laughs> It was a, nat a naturalist. A naturalist. <laughs> I'm not going to talk. That's over a long time ago. <laughs> we'll forget that. Who told you that? I'm not sure little which bird, one. Little bird told us something. Little bird. Somebody named Little Bird. We tried everything. <laughs> except liquor. Dick never drank and I never drank. So uh, we made a pact right after we married. Not we, to drink. Not to drink. And of course, Dick had no one drug. brother that drank too much. So, uh, he didn't listen. Did, did Dick have... And we never smoked either, either of us, so... Did, did, were there alcoholics in the family? Uh, no, but there was one that overdid it a little. You didn't the like The oldest those. one. You didn't like that kind of behavior, yeah. No. Dick had a big personality, didn't he? I guess, yes. You can tell by his pictures. Yeah. Photographs. And Dick and his brothers, Dick and Bob were both six foot four. Eddie and, Marie and uh, John were about six two. And Dick's father was a good six foot which was pretty tall for his generation. And Dick's mother was tall. She must have been about 5'10". She was, a, she was a character, but she was so not. She was a pioneer woman. I mean, she had her gopher caught for out in the fields and go kept, get gophers. She smoked. And she could roll her own with the men on the ranch. Oh. And uh, she was very good to me. She was a big woman, but she was a really nice huh. and always fun. Fun, that's a good word. Nice you to had have me fun. talking more than I talk any time. Mm. I've never have been just, a big talker. You have just been talking <laughs> a lot. <laughs> that's what we wanted, so that's good. Well, you got me going. <laughs> Donna was special, very special to me. And uh, Your only girl. My only girl. Actually, Dean, I wanted to name him Dean Allen. When he was born, and uh, then I thought about it. His initials would have been Dam, and I could <laughs> see a third boy getting in trouble. That so right. he didn't. He's Dean Lewis, which was Dick's father's name. So um, Alan got the name later. But so Donna, what was Donna's middle name? M Ruth, which oh, I didn't Ruth want. After but you. I don't like the name Ruth, never have. Oh. But Dick insisted, so she's Donna. She was Donna Ruth. And she was, and what? She was a special, special she, girl. Was she your special because it was a girl thing, you and mom what? and daughter? Mom and daughter was a very special relationship? Yes, yes, and we had a special relationship. We got along very well, except a couple of years when it was in the makeup and things, which was too early. We kind of... She wanted to wear a lot of makeup? <laughs> we uh, kind of argued about that. But then uh, the rest of her life, she was great. She and a girlfriend went to a dance in the summer out at Wainema, which is kind of put on for high school kids. And she met Gary that night. The next day, he was on the phone. And uh, she was still 15. He was 16. They were 
different schools, different same grade. Uh, from that day, he was around here constantly. Very nice. I'm very fond of Gary. And uh, they married when Gary was 20 and she was still 19. And that was the only objection we had was that it was too young. He was a lot older. And they had a great marriage. Good. And then we lost her four years in December, in November. That was difficult. It was a very difficult. And she felt like she had the flu or something. Went to the doctor and he checked her out. He sent her for a MRI. And that's when he found she had this bile duct cancer. Which, bile duct? Bile duct, which, and then the liver had a little, which they could have taken out, but couldn't do the bile ducts. So she lasted just about a year. And oh, she was dear. really sick. So, uh, and her son-in-law, Scott Vegeta, got her in, they lived up in Carmel Valley, and they got her into Stanford, and then she was up with them, a good part of the... Stanford handled a lot of that, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but they, just, and I miss her so much. That's a real, a real it's, difficult, I think, for all parents. And then Dean's wife, yeah. Last December, I was going to have the big cousin's party on Christmas. And so the Thursday, I think two weeks before Christmas, she was here and she'd been to Costco and she brought me some plies that she knew. And it was just fine. It's typical Tony. She was a sweetheart. And... Uh, then it was a Wednesday, Thursday night. She woke Dean up, middle of the night, on great pain. Took her to the emergency hospital. They put her in. They opened her up the next day, and her intestines were just all gone. And she was gone Sunday morning. Oh, my gosh. Never, never really been sick. She oh, looked shocking. healthy. Those are so was, rare, those things. As far as I was concerned, was her helping suffered on Wednesday. Just so That's bad. a shock, wow. Oh, it's a shock. And a great loss. Huh? A great loss. A great loss. Yeah, well, I'm sorry for that for you, but... Now, but, uh, uh, now we've talked about all the children except Alan. Alan. Oh, he was a big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> He was seven years later, a big surprise. Oops. I did lose two years. Would been, she would have been two years younger than Donna. I lost a, a girl at five months. You lost another one. The baby was dead and they had to take her. So. But, and Donna always said she liked her position in the family. Uh -huh. She liked the, being the only girl. So. Yeah, being the only uh, Okay, so... And, and Alan was a surprise. Well, they were all, actually, was, all of them were surprises. And said. what was Alan into all the time? Huh? What was Alan into? He was always old for his age, always has been, even as a little one. And we had this Aileen, who I had a... A lady, a black lady who had been with me for a long time cleaning. Her name was Resenda. And she had this aunt that was coming from Texas. And so I think Alan was about two weeks old when she came to us. And she had to be exactly what a southern mammy was. She was, and she loved Alan. She was. She just loved, loved to get him to dressed up and take him to church on Sunday mornings in her church. And he loved it because it's not a quiet church. Oh, Southern Baptist or it's something? A, yeah. 
<laughs> and they sang a lot. <laughs> he loved to go. So she was with us until he was six. And um, she didn't live here. She lived in town just a little ways. But she was here all day, five days a week. Uh -huh. And um, then we had the Watts riots. The Watts and riots. You remember the Watts I riots? I sure do. And Aileen was so upset. And she kept saying, I don't like what my people are doing. And at that point, she wanted to go back to Texas. She just did not want to stay in California after the war. Oh, so, that was pretty devastating, yes. It was I, devastating. I agree. And she was just very upset with her race. But uh, So with she, all of your wonderful life, um, what, what do you think about marriage? I think marriage is great. <laughs> I do. I certainly had a good marriage. Uh, do you have a reason why you think it was a good marriage? We got along beautifully. We agreed on a lot of things. We did a lot together. In fact, Dick always wanted me around. So but he would go off to farm bureau meetings or things in the evening. But uh, we just, we did hit it up. We knew each other pretty well, because we've been together almost six years. You did, yeah. Married, which I think maybe is not too bad. <laughs> 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 so, but I, I don't know. My parents had a good marriage, so. What do you think? Keep, what do you think makes a good marriage besides liking the same things? But are there other things? Well, you work together. Communication. Hmm. Communication. Education too, I think, makes a difference. Right. Right. And I think your growing up period makes a difference too. Dick had a wonderful mother. Mm -hmm. He didn't remember his father a lot. I had good, wonderful parents. So you both had good backgrounds. Yeah. Yes. We just wanted to talk a little bit about your bucket list. My what? Your bucket list. What Something that you haven't done in your uh, life that you'd like to do. At my age, I'm pretty... Glad that I've done all I have, have done. Didn't you say something about balloon? Oh, I always wanted to go for a balloon ride. <laughs> that never happened. No. That never happened. Richard was all set on Janet's 65th birthday to take her for a balloon ride out in Moore Park. And he asked me if I wanted to go. And that's, what, seven years ago? And I said, sure. And then it turned out the weather, they couldn't go. And it's never been done since. Well, maybe you'll get lucky. Someone will take you for a balloon ride. You still have time. Well, I will say I have loved living in this house for 70 or 65 years. It's been a wonderful experience, a wonderful to raise a family. And I've raised, Dick and I raised a beautiful family. Yes. We've had no problems with any of them. They all have done well. They are all good to me, with good to their dad. And uh, I couldn't have asked for more. It's a surprise to me to start out alone with no, no siblings and have all this big family. And I can't believe that I have 18 grandchildren. And now with Don marrying and bringing two children in the house, I have 21 great-grandchildren. I want to say thank you for being such a great family. Really, I have five wonderful kids. I couldn't ask for anything better. 
had a wonderful husband. I've had a wonderful life. I really have. I think he's bad. I've been so fortunate. And uh, the traveling I've done, which I never expected to do, just that I do appreciate all my children, and they are all so good to me. The boys check on me all the time. And Donna was wonderful. So, well, that the boys are they're great. 